Welcome to this Autism Ontario webinar, Interventions for Autistic Children and Youth. What are they? Where do they target? And where can I access these? My name is Matthew Lay, and as always, I will be your host. Today, we are joined by Tracy Limblad. Tracy is a duly accredited, uh, credentialed speech language pathologist and board certified behavioral analyst with over 35 years experience working in schools, um, settings, not-for-profits, and private practice. And she's no stranger to the Autism Ontario webinar desk. We actually had Tracy here not that long ago. And this webinar is part two of that webinar that we did earlier this year, which was an overview of intervention programs for young autistic children, a link to which, if you did not check, is in the um, resource section. Okay, now before we get started, I have a couple of things I need to I need to say. First off, opinions reflected in this presentation are those of the speakers, the presenters, myself, and do not necessarily reflect Autism Ontario's views. Please note that Autism Ontario does not endorse any specific therapy, product, or treatment. We do, however, endorse your right to information. Autism Ontario strongly believes it is important that you do your own research when it comes to these matters and make informed decisions, and that's part of what these sessions are also about. I'd also like to um, handle language. Um, I want to review the language that we'll be using during the presentation. Autism means something different to everyone. Medical professionals, researchers, providers may use one term. An individual or their family may refer to themselves um, differently. The different terms you'll hear us use to describe autism are either person-first perspective, um, example, person with autism, or identity-first label. Um, autistic person. Uh, person first language reflects the idea that autism can be separated from a person and doesn't define them, similar to phrases such as living with autism. While identity first language reflects the belief that being autistic is an important part of a person's identity and cannot be separated. Okay. Um, a reminder, if you're tuning in for the very first time, my role here is almost, I mean, is not that important and really my heavy lifting is almost over, is to get you answers to your questions. So ensure that throughout the presentation, you use the ask a question box to uh, submit your questions and I will aspire to get you answers from, uh, from Tracy. Um, if you have any issues, please click on the help button and make sure you click on the resource widget. There is um, a lot of helpful stuff in there that we will be referencing, including the PowerPoint slides, as well as a list of programs that we will be talking about through, throughout the day. And finally, before you go, make sure that you complete our survey. Um, it helps us uh, do better and put on uh, better presentations such as this. Uh, and with that, I'd like to welcome Tracy to the stage. Uh, Tracy, thanks so much for, for being here with us today. No, thank you for having me. And too bad we couldn't be in person, but you know, it's Canada and it's winter. Yes, it is. It is. And you know what? We've had a pretty good winter so far, right? We haven't had a lot of incremental weather. And so um, we shouldn't be shouldn't be complaining that much about it, although it's always better to be to be with you in um, uh, in person. Um, I think most of our audience probably knows um, uh, a lot about you. You're you are quite frequent with us. But if you could just talk a little bit about your experience and what brings you to uh, to to uh, to today and, and why we're talking about treatment with you. Sure. Okay. Yeah. I'm a speech and language pathologist, like Matt has said earlier. I also have a master's of education and curriculum. I'm a board certified behavior analyst, and I have training in uh, many different areas, but um, three of the main areas are augmentative and alternative communication, uh, the picture exchange communication system, uh, system pediatric feeding disorders. Um, I am an employee of Autism Ontario, so I'd like to declare uh, that, um, but I have no other conflicts to declare. The information that we're going to present today is information meant to help you as either parents or providers or um, yourself, if you're here as an autistic individual, to determine what uh, treatments, intervention strategies may benefit you, um, may benefit your child to actually have an optimal outcome. So these, this really is information about uh, what is out there, uh, what does the current research say, and where can you find some of those treatments? 
Excellent, excellent. Um, I referenced our last conversation. Um, can you talk a little bit about where this picks off, the differences between our last presentation and, and this presentation? Yeah, sure. So our last presentation were, uh, was about intervention strategies for young or young children or early learners. So those right. uh, individuals were under the age of six and would be just looking at foundation skills, uh, learning communication, uh, maybe starting school, uh, doing some group sessions. So it really was about those services that um, are available and would look at those areas. So if you're looking at the government funding program, so the Ontario Autism Program, we're talking about things like caregiver mediated early learning programs, the entry to school programs, as well as core clinical services. So those private providers, but that focus on children, uh, preschool children or, early, or young children. Okay. This today, we're moving into the older children. So children who are in school, so six years to 18 years of age, their needs can be a bit different. So we may be looking at individuals who need um, social skills or, or better communication skills, or are those youth and uh, young adults who are moving perhaps into some uh, jobs as part of uh, secondary experience or co-ops. So what intervention makes sense for those individuals? Okay, so our former agenda is important skills for children and youth for positive experiences, empirical support and evidence based practice, treatments and program type. We're going to go through intervention description, specific skills targeted, current level of evidence, and access to the program. And at the end, um, we are going to be focusing on how you make those decisions. So as we jump in and as we get started, we're going to be talking about, let's talk about the skills that are important for youth between six and 18 years, because I've been here before. I've seen one of these, one of these graphs. Walk us through what we're looking at here, uh, here, Tracy. Sure. So between the ages of grade one until high school years, so up until about 18th birthday, there's a number of areas of development and the skills that are important for your child uh, to experience independence for peer interactions ongoing learning for school success and for community access or employment. So these skills, uh, when children are a bit older, require increasing independence and lessening of supports, assistance, or what we call prompts or cues. So generally in, in neurotypical children, fully in full independence is usually attained around a 10 to 12 year old developmental level. So if you can recall back to your grade, like grade five to seven, you actually at that age have most of the skills you need, not fully refined, but most of the skills you need to be pretty independent in your life. So the building, those building blocks of learning have been established and you kind of refine them as you get older throughout the rest of your lifetime. So some of the things that we'll look at in the programs that we're gonna talk about for the next hour are things like sustaining attention and concentration learning and problem solving. Those acti activities of daily living like hygiene, bathing, grooming, shaving, hairstyling, uh, motor coordination, fine and gross motor skills, refining your understanding of language and, and longer language, um, being able to express yourself better. So uh, within reading and written language as well, uh, communication skills. So, you know, communicating with different uh, levels or people. So you communicate differently to your friends versus your family versus your boss. Uh, and then looking at things like social skills and self-management skills or those community skills and then hobbies and leisure skills. So though these skills are the, the areas that we will look at um, and see if your child or a student that you're working with needs help in these areas, then which providers or which types of treatments or programs make sense for that? Okay, and when we talk about treatments or programs, it's important to understand, we've got a rating scale, right? And so it's important to understand, you know, how we're grading and what we're looking for as it relates to empirical support, which is a, word, a term I love, or evidence-based practice. So what does this mean and, and why is it important when looking at uh, when looking at the various treatments? 
Right. And many professionals actually have to take into account empirical support. And that is a word that most public don't use. But for people who are in uh, healthcare professions or in science related professions, uh, we really have to look at the quality of the evidence out there to make determinations whether um, it's good or it's getting there or it isn't really good for the individuals that we treat. So empirical support means we're looking at research studies, so peer-reviewed studies that have been published, that they're high quality. Not all research studies are equal. And so we really want to look at those that have high quality, that they've been conducted across various places, so not just one thing. So, you know, many of us know about programs or treatments that the person who invented it is the person who puts out all the research and nobody else can replicate it. So, you know, we're not talking about those, we're talking about research studies that have been done worldwide. But most importantly, you want to look at the research and the treatments that match your individual child. So you'll see in some of the areas that I talk about today, there is some research and people will say, but there, there is evidence, but often not with children with autism. And so it won't really match your child and therefore may not give you the same outcomes that you would hope for. So we're really looking at, and what I've done is distill this down for you. Um, I love research, I do research, but I know most parents can't access research or don't have time. Uh, so what my aim today was to distill it for you, gather that information and present it to you so that you can make better decisions without having to do all that background work. In evidence-based practice in clinical services it's a process and so sometimes there's things there's treatments that don't have a lot of research behind them they may be new they may be novel and maybe something from the past that doesn't have anything any new research so what that means is we have to then as a clinician work through this series of steps in order to make sure we're doing the best we can for your child so that we're going to get potentially the best outcome. So that means that we have to take that external evidence, those research studies and what they say, together with our clinical expertise and our, our um, the way that we have actually worked, what we've seen work in the past. So our expert opinion, with, together with you as the client. So your environment, your goals, your wishes, have to be taken into account in order to come up with goals and treatments that that meet your needs so they have to work for your family they have to work for the individual there has to be evidence the clinician has to have experience with it and then when we implement we have to take ongoing data to make sure that it's going as intended and so that's called evidence-based practice so it's important to know that 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 client and patient and caregiver are at the center that you know it really is a discussion with with clinicians about what should be happening and what goals and how we're going to meet those goals not just something that was seen on instagram or so and so's parents that it worked well for their their child there's a little more that 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 goes into it what are some examples of evidence-based practices in clinical services So some of the examples of evidence-based practice are things like um, if you're doing picture exchange communication system and, you know, there's a manual that you follow. And so the things that you really want to do is look at, there's a manual, uh, does my child require this? Uh, do they have the foundation skills to benefit from it? Am I able to be trained so that I know what's going on? Can we see data that we see that my child is making progress and we can keep going to the next step? Um, or do we have to kind of regroup and make some adjustments and tweaks and think about something else? And so then that kind of um, team-based approach where the client is at the center, the data guides you, is the hallmark of evidence-based practice. So it, it doesn't necessarily mean that you always have to have really good evidence for what you're trying. Sometimes a clinician will recommend something. It doesn't really fit with the family, doesn't really meet their needs at that time. There may be external things going on that you know, you're gonna just find difficult and you can't do it at the time. 
So then it becomes a dialogue about what does work. What's, what's, you know, perhaps number two, what would be number three? What could we do in the meantime? And then you work through it together. So when we get into the, the, you know, when we talk about any specific practice, I mentioned there was like ratings. So talk to us about how you came up with these ratings. Are these your, is these your specific or is there, is this come from, um, how generally, you know, uh, this is a general practice. Talk a little bit about, about those so people understand what they're, what they're looking at. Right. So this rating, there's a number of rating uh, reports for autism and autism treatment. So not necessarily when we look at ratings for autism treatments, we don't look at it by profession or by provider. So, you know, just speech pathology ones, just ABA ones, it's, it's actually looked at more broadly. So when people do ratings, they're usually groups in universities and associations that come up with these ratings. They will gather all the research that they can find. So thousands and thousands of studies if there is on an area, and then they will look at the quality of the evidence, how robust, how good are the outcomes? Are they minimal or are they really effective? Uh, do they just get those outcomes in a lab or really controlled setting? Or, you know, if you do a community-based program, can you get that same outcome? And uh, and then they rate them. And so they will come up with, so research is used evidence-based, emerging or not evidence-based. So those main three headings at the top. Um, but many studies or many other rating reports will use different language. So what I thought was, and this came from the ONTABA, the Ontario ABA Association, and one of their, um, per, their uh, resources, they have listed all the different terminology that you might see. And then in the very bottom line is your kind of, you know, go, go to. So if it's got good evidence, it's very effective, then definitely use that. And then clinicians, actually, that's what we're supposed to start with. If something has really good evidence, it's been shown to be really effective, we're supposed to start there. Um, mm -hmm. However, sometimes there's some new and emerging things coming out. So you can also do those, but you want to proceed with a bit of caution. And that's where you want to make sure you're collecting data, make sure it's working for your child. But then there's this other category that it's not evidence based, but that's made up of two different types of uh, types of research studies. Either there's not, en not enough studies yet to actually figure out is this going to work or not, or there's a number of studies, well-defined studies, good quality, but they show it's not effective. So for both of those, you have to think about not using those because if there's not enough studies and yet there might be something else that has really good outcomes, you want to go there. You don't want to waste your time, your money, your child's time and do something that, you know, possibly is less effective than something we know about. And you certainly don't want to use something that's been shown to be harmful or ineffective. And those things exist. There's um, unfortunately in social media. That's often where a lot of this is, is supported and talked about. Uh, th this is an industry. And unfortunately, there are those out there that have, you know, developed products, developed treatments that are not effective, could be harmful, um, but they make money off of them. And so as consumers, it's kind of like a consumer's reports. You want to actually make good decisions, have all the decisions, think about what you need for your child and your family and then look at those treatments. Okay. So let's get into um, interventions and commercially available programs, um, foundational family services, core clinical services. And, and, and as we do, last time we did this, we tried to get through all of, all of the programs. This time we didn't. What we did this time was we offered a resource. Now this resource is available to all of you in the resource section. You can pop it up. You can download it um, and save it and save it to your computer. But in there, we're going to have um, uh, sort of scorecards just like this for various for various programs, and we're going to be referencing them throughout the rest of this this presentation. So, Tracy, we're going to use this one as an example. Kind of walk us through what we're seeing here, um, so that um, so the audience understands how to how to read these when they when they download them. Right, and I'm I'm not seeing the scorecard that's up. Do you want? Did oh, you want me to pull one up? Right. No, there you go. 
no, I I'm forgot kidding. to keep <laughs> Okay, so this is in your resource uh, package that Matt talked about. All the different treatments that we're talking about in the next 40 minutes um, will have a corresponding slide like this in the resource package. So what it will tell you is the name of the treatment, the typical providers that can provide this service, um, and this one is AAC or augmentative and alternative communication. So there are AAC specialists, behavior analysts that have, um, expertise in this, educators sometimes uh, can do this, speech language pathologists uh, can sometimes do this. Uh, there will be a section on type of service, so usually it's direct, one-to-one -one or consultation. Uh, a short description of the treatment, certainly couldn't go into detail because I wanted to keep it succinct, but there'll be a short description on ages of, of who it can apply to, general outcomes. So the what does the research currently say about those things? And then the rating. And the rating, again, comes from that chart we just discussed. So does it show good evidence? Is it on a, one of those national standards list? Um, and is it eligible under one of the OAP funding streams? So for everything we talk about, there will be a slide like this, uh, and we won't be bringing them up, but they're there for your resource to kind of do a more deeper dive. Um, and as well, in another resource uh, that's available to you, I have provided all direct links. If there's a really good website for, uh, for a certain intervention or where to find more information if you want more information. So instead of talking about each of these separately, we're going to talk generally in, in uh, larger um, sort of areas of treatment, but you have all the information there. Excellent, okay. So getting back to innovation, uh, intervention uh, pathways, uh, direct teaching interventions uh, and behavioral skills training. Talk us through this, this graph, please. Yeah, yeah happy to. So this graph um, is really what determines or, or what's been found to help a treatment meet that evidence-based practice or that empirical uh, support. And really, it is the hallmark of teaching. So if you're trying to find a really good intervention or you have a provider working with your child or a clinician, this five-step approach has been shown to be very effective for everybody, not just neurodivergent individuals, but for all of us. And so the five steps really are that, you know, you have to explain the skill. So let the person know what you're doing. You have to demonstrate it. So they need to see what the skill looks like. Then there's a practice component where you practice, you may provide extra prompting or cueing, um, and then you provide correction or feedback to the individual. And then they have to have homework. You have to generalize that skill outside of that setting. So this is called behavior skills training. And I just wanted to show you this because then you might get um, a bit better about, oh yeah, okay, I see that, yeah, there's a there's a, a part of this intervention that explains it. And then the next part, I see there's a model or there's a video or the, the children are role playing. And then they've got feedback. And then we keep practicing it outside. So this is a really nice um, sort of way to look at skills or look at intervention to really think about, oh, okay, this one seems solid, like a solid approach. And it is the core of most parent-mediated interventions, meaning the parent is taught what to do and you're expected to actually work with your child to teach them some of the skills or goals. So this is an important slide, I, I feel. Okay. Um, when we say direct therapy services, what are we referring to? So we're referring to those different types of services or interventions that are often provided by regulated health professionals. So in Ontario, that would be speech pathologists, occupational therapists, uh, would be psychotherapists, psychologists, and um, soon to be behavior, uh, behavior analysts, which or board certified behavior analysts. Right now, BCBAs or behavior analysts are going through the process of regulation in Ontario. We are um, overseen or credentialed by an American association right now, but that is coming under Ontario. So these are regulated health professionals, so are the helping professions that would be providing services. And they provide assessment services, direct one-to-one, -one, small group, consultation, large group. It really depends on what 
the skill is and what the intervention is. And these private, these services are all part of the Ontario Autism Program under core clinical services, but they're also all available privately as well in the province. And I guess, um, like, for, this is this is all ideal for the audience that we are that we're targeting um, here here today, correct? Yes, absolutely. So the these are the services that will um, help your child or your school age child to learn those specific skills or goal areas that would help them become more independent, would um, give them a more optimal outcome, and would carry them through. Uh, school and and after school. So what you're really looking at is choosing that correct provider uh, or correct service that that meets your child's needs. So um, some of these uh, also in Ontario can be covered under third party payers or your health insurance. So some parents may have some funding. It's not usually that great, unfortunately, but some funding under insurance as well as government funding. Okay. Excellent. Um, so in this scenario, I mean, we almost cannot talk about um, any sort of treatment without the overlap uh, of services, but this looks like a fairly complex chart you've, you've put together for us. Mm -hmm. So let's talk about that service overlap so that we understand what we're looking at. Right. So just to complicate things for parents, which it's already complex, um, there are, it's called in in clinical work that there's an overlap in our scope of practice, meaning that different, different clinicians have training in similar areas to other clinicians. So it, speech pathologists or behavior analysts, both can be trained. Each, each of those different providers can be trained in augmentative communication, eating and feeding, language development, play and leisure skills, reading, social skills, speech shaping, and written language. So it makes it, in some, in some ways it gives you more um, choice as a consumer, but sometimes it makes it a little difficult if you have teams and you have two or three people that all can treat the same area because they come at it from different frameworks, from different theories, and it's really important to understand that as the consumer, if you're putting together teams of providers, which is always recommended for autism, because not any one provider actually has the breadth of training to meet all the needs of the child. And so you really do want to use different providers, but it's important that they collaborate, that they talk to each other, that they're not working in cross purposes. So I felt that you know, looking at this or having this kind of a chart that says, okay, if I'm looking at eating and feeding, okay, and I have an SLP and a behavior analyst and an OT, they may all come at it differently. And to get the best outcomes, you're going to have to have a more collaborated approach, a consistent approach. And so as the parent, unfortunately, lots of times it falls to you to actually get everyone talking together. Um, it's all of in our ethical guidelines, our practice guidelines that we need to talk to each other. It does take some coordination though. And it's important, I think, that parents understand that it's not that, oh, you know, this person shouldn't be doing this. Only a speech pathologist does social skills. It's not quite true. Um, or only an OT should be doing feeding. That's not quite true. SLPs and, and behavior analysts may have, you know, really good training in that as well and some good outcomes. So you really want to understand who's trained in what and then how do we get the best outcomes when we use a team. It sounds really, I mean, really important that we, that you're always doing, making these decisions with the help of your, your full team, right? Like mm -hmm. it, it should not be something that we read about, even with all the great resources that we're giving parents today with the with the efficacy and in and the in the, the rating system it's not something that they should be making decisions on on their own everyone needs to be needs to be a part of it it sounds like in order to to make it the the most effective absolutely i mean it's your it's your providers it's your clinicians or professionals professional people that can actually do the assessments and understand 
how the developmental order works, what's best, what's, what would be most functional for your child, and which skills are actually more, most socially significant. So which things would give um, you as a family the best quality of life, the best outcomes for not only you know, your child, but the entire family, what makes the most difference. And those conversations, although sometimes difficult, because like I said, you're trained differently than different professions, but when you can work as a team, that child is at the center, everyone's there for the same reason, then typically you get much better outcomes when you function as a really um, um, collaborative, communicative team. Great. Okay, we're going to move to ABA, and we're going to be talking once again about uh, applied behavioral analysis, focused ABA, intensive ABA. And I know that a lot of folks, you know, when when looking at this, feel like the more intensive, the better, or the more uh, the more time with with a therapist, the better. Um, but in general, how do you how does one decide what's right for you know, ABA versus focused ABA uh, and, and the like. Yeah, so it's a decision, it's a discussion and decision and with all the information. So once you understand where a specific child is functioning, what skills that they need to perhaps um, develop a stronger, stronger use of, or what skills are really already strong, um, but you know not used perhaps the way they need to be or not generalized, then it becomes, excuse me, a discussion about uh, what makes sense. So how many goals do I have? Uh, how, what, what is the needs level of my child? So do I have a child that has got you know, fewer needs they're very verbal, they can communicate, uh, they go to school, they're, you know, not much of the curriculum is, is um, modified for them. So for that child, intensity, um, and when, we, when we're looking in this section on ABA, w probably wouldn't be recommended because they really need more focused ABA. So you need to look at the one or two goals that they may need to work on and decide, oh, you know, we can meet those goals in a couple of hours a week. They don't need to be withdrawn from school. They don't need intensive ABA. Um, and so clinicians or providers make those decisions based on the profile of the child. And, and then you recommend the intensity and the types of services. Okay. So um, let's talk about uh, ABA in general um, and the different models uh, and, and like that's, uh, that's available. Right. So in ABA, there's two models, one called what Matt has already said, focused ABA, which is generally less hours. Um, so, uh, you know, maybe 15 to 25 hours is what the research says, but it can be as few as three to four hours a week focused ABA. There's generally only one or two goals that you're targeting at a time. And then comprehensive ABA, which has also been called early intensive behavior intervention or intensive behavior intervention is that intensive ABA that you know people know about that was actually uh, devised or developed as a uh, preschool program, which is the early intensive behavior intervention. So full time, lots of goals, lots of areas of skill that you're looking at developing. When you're looking at children who are six to 18 years of age, we typically wouldn't recommend that comprehensive ABA. Um, number one, they're usually in school. Number two, they usually have developed those foundation skills. Or if they're a bit older and they haven't yet developed some of those foundation skills, there's curriculum that are better. So you'll see in that the previous our previous webinar, we talked about things like the ABLES R or VB Map, um, Early Start Denver model the ebic so there's like three or four curriculum that are really geared to preschool children so you're you're really working on things like you know how little wee kids toddlers play things like that that wouldn't be really appropriate for children who are eight nine ten or older so there's different uh curriculum that are available that would be more appropriate so if your child still needed some of those skills there are better curriculums to use for children who are older and I think the next slide, we talk about a couple of those. 
So here, so if your child is older, but still really requires more intensive uh, services, they have um, higher needs, then you really should consider things like the Essentials for Living curriculum, which goes all the way through adulthood, or the PEAK curriculum, which goes up to eight years of age. And so those curriculum will match more your child, their current environment, and the, the skills that you need to look at. When we look at focus, sorry, Matt, I was just gonna keep going because I, I see the time. Yeah, just keep going. Uh, I was, that was verbal diarrhea, me just saying, and focused ABA. So I'll leave it to you. <laughs> and in focused ABA, again, we said one or two hours, maybe one or two goals. Usually within this area, we're looking at things like dressing, eating, sleeping, toileting, or for you know a bit older kids, those maybe in like grade six to, to 12, um, or in special uh, ed classes, things like being out in the community. So transit training, how to use a debit card, how do I make my lunch? Things that really are those life skills that you need to be as independent as possible when you're older. The other uh, area where focused ABA is really um, something that you need to look at is if there's challenging or self injurious behaviors. So if there's really significant behavior, then you need to look at uh, that area of focused ABA. And in the OAP, that um, would there's also a pillar that's called urgent response services, and that is a focused ABA program. Okay. So um, this chart takes us through the some various treatments that we uh, that we have, and then from there I'm going to go to an audience question. A reminder, folks, submit your questions at any time. I'm holding them for the right place in the presentation if I can, like this one that came in earlier. But uh, feel free to submit them. We're looking at them, and we'll make sure that you get answers. Right. So this is where we bring in. So we've talked a lot about you know these labels, these names of types of programming. This is where we bring in the evidence. So what what does the research say about comprehensive or intensive ABA? There is good evidence for it. So if your child matches the characteristics of the children that were in those studies, there's good evidence. What do we know about focused ABA? Good evidence for focused ABA. Lots of studies for a long period of time across the world. Um, what do we know about activities for daily living? So that a behavioral approach to teach those things, very good evidence. What do we know about augmentative communication? Really good evidence for picture exchange communication, emerging evidence for speech generating devices. And that's what that SGD means, speech generating devices. There have not been many studies at all to date that have children with autism as part of the research study. So even though people may be saying that, oh, get a, get a speech generating device, use ProLoco to go, use LAMP, use, there really isn't the evidence at this point to say, yes, it's going to make a really big difference. So this is where you're going to need to take that data and work with your team about it. The Essentials for Living curriculum, very good evidence for that. Um, the PEAK curriculum, very good evidence. So, and then instrumental activities of daily living, those teaching things like out in the community, transit training, using a behavioral approach. So overall, using behavioral services for children um, that have those needs that match the programs or the approach that you're, that you're looking at have very good evidence in, uh, okay. for, for autism treatment. Excellent. So I think we're going to get a little bit into this later on um, when it comes to making decisions. But since we're on the topic of ABA, we have a, a audience member um, who whose child is is um, has ABA um, services that they're that they're participating in, and they want to know how to assess if ABA therapy is working for their child. Uh, so part of the assessment, and that's a good question. We all have to assess for any type of of therapy that you're getting, is it working for my child? Because what you want is to see sort of constant progress. You want to see that the goals that the treatment team have developed for your child are being met, um, that, that you're seeing progress. You should be seeing changes at home. Uh, it's not okay for any therapy to just get changes in the therapy session. Your child is not gonna be with that therapist 
you know, for the rest of their lives. That therapist is not going to be in different environments. So you're really wanting to see that what you're working on, you're going to see generalize, we call it, to other places or maintain outside of the therapy session. So what you want to do is meet with your team, go through the goals, see the data. In ABA, we're required as behavior analysts to graph our data. So really we want to look at, is the graph going in the right direction? Am I seeing progress? Or perhaps we've missed a foundation skill or there's something else going on that you need to really talk about or think about and look at before you're gonna see progress. But it really becomes in ABA, if your child is comprehensive ABA or there was intensive treatment, uh, it, is, it is well supported in the research that in within three months, you should see significant change. If you do not see significant change in three months, then that's where I'd start to ask some questions. Okay. Um, and, and I assume that it's documented. And so if you're working with, with a, a behavioral therapist, they're going to, they're going to be talking about that as well. One more question mm-hmm. before we get back to the, to the, to the content. Um, can you give more information about urgent response type therapy? It seems very vague in the OAP documents. So uh, unfortunately, I'm not going to be um, able to give you very much information because that's actually not an area I really work in. But uh, on the website, on the ministry website, it has urgent response services, what the inclusion criteria are. Um, but there's also, uh, I believe on the ministry website, um, a page that shows you who are the specific providers or agencies who provide urgent response services for your area. So those would be the people that I would contact directly and get more information from. It varies region to region. Uh, I think probably because of providers, because of numbers, um, because of availability. Uh, it, it, so it, if I gave you an answer, it wouldn't it may not be appropriate for where you are. Um, so really, you, you, you know, go, I would go back to the, the ministry and, and call those providers directly who provide their urgent response. Excellent. And if Autism Ontario has any more information on that topic, they will no doubt try and get back to you. We have your information. Uh, one of the beauties of doing this in a webinar format. Um, okay, let's move on to occupational therapy. It's part of the overall care circle. Um, Let's uh, let's jump into that at this point. Yeah, and I'm just going to go through this pretty quickly so we can get to that chart again of the different types of things. So OT is really related to to um, helping people learn new ways of doing things, regaining skill, um, being able to do your occupation. So your occupation, we think about it as parent or as adults as work, but it's being a, if you're a student, it's being able to do all the aspects of being a student and in school. If you're a toddler, being able to do all the aspects of that you need to be a toddler and play with things. So it really is about looking at, do you have those skills? Do you have motor skills, your planning skills? And then what can we do to uh, help those develop? Okay. So in the next slide, we talk a bit of, again, it's a it's a regulated health profession, so they do one-to-one or group. Um, typically in occupational therapy, it's one to three hours a week. Uh, they work on, you know, one to two goals uh, at a time. And it can be, you know, specific skill building, small groups like printing or, um, you know, learning how to ride a bike or learning how to move your body in space. So it can look very different depending on the goal and the type and the therapist. But when we look at the, at, you know, what types of things that most uh, you see in occupational therapy, and you'll see this with the next few uh, clinicians, OT therapy overall has mixed evidence. And it's not surprising because there's so many things that OTs do that if you take one little thing out of there, like if we say, okay, like handwriting, there's really good evidence for handwriting, but sensory diets not supported, Um, you know, the sensory integration emerging. So it's really mixed. So you can't really just say occupational therapy is good evidence because you have to be more specific. So if we look at activities of daily living, occupational therapists are amazing at working at the, uh, at, you know, treating activities of daily living, like eating, dressing, toileting, all of those things that make someone independent. But again, I talked about air sensory integration, looking at, you know, how to integrate your senses, how to actually um, 
look at hypo uh, responding or hyper responding to certain sensory input, it's just emerging. We actually only have to date three studies so far, and it's only on one national standards report that it is even emerging. Um, handwriting. So handwriting is not a program. I'm not talking about you know handwriting with tear without tears. If you're looking at what are the motor um, movements you need for handwriting for print or for cursive writing, uh, occupational therapists good evidence in that area. Good evidence for teaching how to how to be out in the community, how to do like transit training, how the, that coaching about how do you cook, how do you set the table, how do you do all of those chores. Um, really some really nice evidence. Sensory diets though is an area that even though it's so popular on social media and lots of money is spent on equipment, um, it really has not shown to be beneficial. So meaning that do the children or the individuals or adults love this stuff? Yes, lots of people love like weighted blankets or um, you know, sitting on balls or all the things that you think about when you think about sensory diets and things like that has it been shown to be really uh, beneficial in changing uh something about how that child functions or that individual individual functions no it hasn't actually been shown to date to be very beneficial in fact um there's a lot of research in sensory diets that shows that it actually can do the opposite so if you, in a classroom, if someone says, oh, they need a fidget toy, um, and then they can attend better, what, it's, what the research has actually shown is that attention decreases, not increases. And so wow. it's, it, you know, yeah. So you have to be careful about what you're, what you're choosing and, uh, and, and looking at all the research. Okay. So and, we look uh, at- Close to your, to your heart here, speech pathology. Yeah, speech language pathology. Again, pretty uh, pretty similar to OT. It has a body of research support in very specific areas for the treatment of autism. Um, it's a discipline with, which is a, has a broad focus. So assessing and treating speech skills, which is talking, uh, language, communication skills, um, social skills, as well as swallowing skills. So you know the eating or feeding, but the swallowing portion. Uh, voice and stuttering and and things that go along with that again one-to-one -one direct therapy or small group and here's what the evidence says that again mixed for generally speech therapy depends what you're talking about uh, some good evidence for augmentative and alternative communication if we're talking about picture exchange not supported yet for some of the other types of AAC so sign language is emerging for children with autism. Uh, speech generating devices, not quite there yet. We don't really have a lot to guide us. There's a lot of AAC um, systems, programs like LAMP or uh, Touch Chat or Flip and Talk, lots of things out there on social media that actually don't have any evidence to date. So that's where if you decide as a family and clinician, that's what you want to do. You need to follow that evidence based practice process. Um, ESI inserts is a early intervention, can go, uh, you know, can extend past um, preschool years. Uh, mainly speech pathologists provide that intervention and it has some good evidence. Jasper is another one. And again, those are in your package that explains these, uh, but it's about joint attention, um, processing, emotional regulation, good evidence. Um, PRT, uh, which is pivotal response therapy, doesn't yet have some uh, some evidence that we'd like. Um, prompt therapy definitely uh, has negative evidence. So prompt therapy is a specific type of therapy where you manipulate your articulators in order to change your speech. And there are no studies to date uh, with children with autism in them. And so there's a lot of speech pathologists who do prompt but they're gonna to have to take their own data to make sure that it's working. And then social stories and social narratives are not quite supported yet uh, under SLP services. You require, social stories could be very effective for your child if they have um, good understanding language. So, you know, their understanding language at at least a six-year-old level, then social stories may be a very effective uh, strategy or treatment for them. 
but there are prerequisite skills for, for those interventions. And when it comes to prerequisite skills, that's important when we're talking about mental health services, correct? Correct. That's very important. So mental health services is a kind of newer area. So you, if you were in the last um, webinar, you didn't hear about mental health because mental health services start around a six year age level. Um, we, when we look at mental health services, those are those providers that treat those uh, anxieties, attention difficulties, depression, mood, mood disorders, those severe challenges that often we see in our youth with autism. Um, so suicidal thoughts, self-harm. Uh, we know that there is a uh, large um, body of individuals with autism and mental health that they go hand in hand more often in adolescence than for uh, those individuals that are neurotypical. And what you want to do is find someone though in mental health services that have both sort of training in mental health, but training with individuals with autism. We are gonna talk about a number of programs that are out there that have research, but I'm gonna tell you right now that you need a good assessment for your child to get a, a proper diagnosis because often what happens with um, children that look like they have anxiety or look like they're depressed, we are, we are labeling them based on our experience and our in kind of internal um, feelings when we experience anxiety or if you've experienced depression. Individuals with autism can look like they have those same behaviors, but it may actually not be a mental health issue. It may be related to something else. It may be related to their stereotypical behavior or their rigidity or something else, but they're not actually going to meet the diagnosis of anxiety or depression or one of the other ones. So it really is important that you get someone who's very familiar with both mental health assessment and diagnosis as well as autism um, to be involved with that so that you're you're confident that you're matching the right treatment uh, to the to uh, you know their mental health issues um, as well uh, for these all of these mental health uh, programs that you're seeing now though these treatment strategies your child or the individual uh, has to have good language skills this this is all considered talk therapy so you have to be able to have, communicate well, have good language skills um, in order to actually make the most uh, benefit of this type of therapy. So when we're looking again, counseling overall mixed for autism because that could mean anything. There's so many different types of counseling. But when we look at things like acceptance and commitment therapy um, and mindfulness, these are starting to have emerging evidence but right now it's limited evidence for adults and teens. There's a small number of individual studies just since 2013 that these things can be effective, but again, um, may for certain individuals, may not for others. The ones that have better evidence are the cognitive behavior therapy, so CBT, dialectical behavior therapy, and things like Facing Your Fears, which is a specific program, and Secret Agent Society, which are specific programs that treat specific things. Uh, and again, in your resource package, there's much more information about each one of these things, what actually they treat, and that kind of how they go about it. But fairly good evidence for mental health services for individuals with autism. Very important for this demographic are social skills. Right, social skills. Hallmark of having a diagnosis of autism is that you have difficulties with social skills or social relatedness. Um, social skills training and intervention can be provided by behavior analysts, speech language pathologists, uh, and, and sometimes you may find other people that are doing them as well. But again, you need to tend to look at the evidence for different types of social skills. So when we look at that evidence for those different programs in the next slide, we find that if anything is following a behavior skills training approach, it typically has good evidence because it's manualized. So again, things that are commercially available that follow that kind of a, a structure are things like skill streaming or children, children's friendship training or the peers groups all follow that BST uh, model. Um, children's friendship training, peers, adolescents, 
uh, social skills groups, those things all have really good evidence with individuals with autism. Uh, some of them have inclusionary and exclusionary criteria. Again, language skills and communication skills will be uh, one of the hallmarks of um, getting being able to partake in some of those groups. However, you can also have a speech pathologist or behavior analyst work on some of those social skills in a one-to-one. -one. And as long as you're following a more of a behavior skills training methodology, there should be some really good outcomes. What we see generally though, if you say, I'm gonna enroll my child in a social skills group, it could have pretty mixed evidence depending on what they're doing in that group, depending on the makeup of the group, depending on the training of the, the clinician. So not all groups are created equal. Again, we're talking about social stories or social narratives. Some good evidence for social stories for um, social skills if your child has good understanding of language. If they have higher needs and more barriers to language, language is difficult for them, then social stories really are not going to have a good effect unless they're there's something else that's bit built into it to help your child understand. So maybe they're picture-based stories, maybe it's just like a narrative, but not um, the traditional, what we call social stories. There is a popular uh, social skills program um, out there called Social Thinking, and it's a collection of materials, and it has not yet got evidence that it's effective. Again, what one of the things to, to come away with from today is materials themselves don't generally have evidence. It's what you do with those materials. So if someone is going to take the social thinking materials and really embed them in a more you know, behavior skills training methodology, then there might be some really nice outcomes. But there is no research to date that actually shows that they've been very effective. Okay. And once again, that resource section is going to have um, deep dives into, into these practices. Okay. So we scheduled our webinar today to go until 1 p.m. We have an important section coming up. Tracy, do you mind staying a little bit longer to finish this, to do the making the decision section? Yeah, no, I'm happy to stay longer. And if people can, great. If not, there is a resource that goes through this section um, very uh, in very much detail. So, okay. you know, uh, feel free to, to access the resource if you have to leave. It's there in your, your resource library. Uh, but we'll go through this section a bit in okay, so before, before, we, before we jump in for everyone, for those of you who have to go, a reminder, this webinar will be recorded, archived, and available on demand tomorrow on the Autism Ontario website. We ask that you share this with fa friends, family members, anyone who you think would be would, would benefit from hearing this presentation. Um, before you go, download the resources and please complete our survey. Um, with this, we're going, I'm going to uh, pass it back to Tracy um to go through making the decisions section of it tracy please go ahead okay so when you're making decisions as a parent you know it's it's really difficult to figure out what do i do how do i evaluate how do i do problem solving and really what you want to do is gather a lot of uh data in that so if we can have the next slide matt thanks um you really want to look at uh using some questions to guide you in making those decisions. So if we look at the next slide, I'm gonna take you through this provider checklist and it will walk you through those things that you really uh, need to ask your providers. So what I'm requesting of you, and I know it's difficult. I know there's a shortage right now, there's waiting lists everywhere. So sometimes parents are just taking the first provider they actually can get which totally understand. I, I would do that as a parent, absolutely. But you want to actually ask a bunch of questions. You want to know that they have credentials, that they're registered in the, in the province to practice, um, that they're on the provider uh, listing. Ontario, Autism Ontario is a provider listing. If they're on the, that listing, then we've vetted them a little bit. We know they have credentials. We know they have insurance. We know they're in Ontario. We know they have actual um, experience with individuals with autism. You want a contract. You want a detailed contract with the fee so that you're informed about what you're getting and what you're paying for and what you can expect. You want to make sure that that provider has training in a specific area. 
there's a lot of assumptions that, you know, speech pathologists all know AAC or they all know feeding. That's not true. Um, or that speech pathologists all know autism or behavior analysts all know child development. That isn't true. So you want to really, you know, match your provider as much as possible with the needs of your child. Um, you want to make sure that, you know, the provider has liability insurance. Uh, and then you are they practicing ethically and professionally? So you need an assessment before you set goals. You want to go through that evidence based practice process. So do you know, do they provide treatment that's research based? Do they take data? Every one of our professions requires some kind of data collection to know that we're making progress. Do they have an open door policy? Are you are you part of the therapy session? Are you being trained? Are you involved? Um, or do they not let you in to see what's going on, which wouldn't be advised? So you really want that collaboration and family involvement. Does your provider that you're picking have continuing education? So most of our professions require continuing education. Are they up to date? And if you're using um, an assistant, like a speech and language assistant or a communicative disorders assistant or OT assistant, professional on a weekly basis, a regular basis, because it is that professional that has all that training. And so you really want to ask yourselves and ask the people that you're, you're kind of interviewing them, um, ask for their CV. Uh, they're required to provide it to you. Uh, so those are some of the things that can help you make good decisions right from the beginning. So the other thing that you want to do is really look at, uh, if we look at the next slide, how do I know if it's working? So now I'm, I'm in therapy, my child's in therapy. Um, how do you really know it's working? So you want to look back to that goal, um, that goal selection. So you should have a document uh, that tells you what goals are being worked on. Uh, are you getting, are you seeing those intended outcomes? Is there data or feedback that you can both discuss and see? Uh, what are the program components? So do you actually know what they're, how they're teaching, what they're teaching? You really want to make sure that those things that you're part of, because this is where it matches, it should match your families, your culture, your values, what's important for your family and your child. And, and that determines then, is that a right fit for your family? Sometimes it's just not a right match. Sometimes your child doesn't respond the same as you thought they would, um, or sometimes you don't feel that it's a really good fit. Um, and so you need to make changes, you know, you, you're not going to find someone who, who can work with everybody. Um, as a speech pathologist and behavior analyst, there were families and children that I really connected with. And then there, there were others that, you know, I just, it wasn't the right fit. And I can't, I, I can't even put my finger on it often. But, you know, at that point, and sometimes the provider will say, I really feel that this isn't going in the direction we wanted. Um, you know, I really think that you you need to go to somebody else, or maybe I can find another provider that has more expertise in a certain area. So you really want to assess the benefits and risks. So sometimes the benefits outweigh the risks, which is I would say, you know, maybe if you're feeling not so included, but your child is making amazing progress, then you may want to think about okay. You know, what is the what is our ultimate outcome? I'm going to I'm going to just keep going with it. But sometimes the benefits don't outweigh the risks and you not feeling included or not feeling right. That gut feeling, sometimes that doesn't outweigh the benefits. So then you have to make some changes. So in the next slide, we actually go through those questions to ask yourself about what are your next steps? So you have to go in that problem solving mode. So first ask, is the treatment or the program supported by research? We've given, I've given you a lot of the research. Is it matched to your child's area of need? And this is sometimes where you'll see on social media, especially ABA didn't work. It was awful. It, my child, you know, it didn't, didn't uh, benefit from it. It might not have been the right match. They may not have needed intensive ABA. And so again, you really want to make sure that match is there. Um, can the current service be changed to better meet your child? Sometimes it's just a tweak or two that you need. Sometimes there was a goal that was missed that was a prerequisite skill. Is there a different treatment that might be better? 
Again, I gave that chart that shows the overlap. So maybe you're getting, I don't know, uh, social skills from a person or from a provider, and it, it just doesn't seem to be going anywhere. There may be a different type of clinician that provides social skills training in your area that may show better outcomes for your child. So again, looking for a different provider or a different treatment that still matches the goals for your child. So where can you find additional information? In the resource document, list all the colleges, the provider listing, there's a, a ask providers that you know, you know, to give you referrals. It's, it's not easy. I, I understand that. I empathize. It's a difficult um, journey. It, it's a, it, and you always sometimes feel like you're starting over there, you know, even as providers, sometimes, you know, we'll have things happen. Our, our staff changes and it's, it's a real impact on the families and the children. And we recognize that, but sometimes you know, it's kind of life. And unfortunately, that's what happens. And you feel like you're starting over again as well. But I think being set up to, to look at this as yeah, I have to do more upfront work um, to prevent some of, of that change uh, sometimes goes a long way. And I think we'll all take it from here. Tracy, we, we did go a little long. I thought it was important. We have retained our audience. So thank you so much, everyone, for, for sticking around. Before we sign off for the day, is there any piece of information you'd like to ensure that you leave our audience with? Any topic that we maybe breeze through, covered, or any anything that you'd like to make sure that everyone walks away with today? I think more just, you know, Having a peer group, as parents, I know people connect on, on Facebook and it's amazing to have a peer support and parent support because those other parents are the ones who know what you're going through. Um, but remember to take, be skeptical. Be skeptical about the information you receive online. Um, so many times as a professional, I like, I wanna jump in and say, no, 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 like don't just, don't just do that. Uh, you have to really make good decisions, your family, you, your child are different than anybody else. And so what works for one person may not work for you. And really what you need to do is get your needs met. And so, you know, really it's, it's taking that time to say, okay, what do we need as a family? And even within families, you know, a, a dad may have completely different needs than the mom and that's okay. And, and really looking at it from that standpoint and also understanding that your child will change. So what your child needed at, you know, two and three years of age will be different than at five and six, again, different at 10, 11, 12, and still different at 18, 19, 20. And so you're going to contact a lot of these different services and programs over the years. And that's to be expected. Not there is not one program that works for all kids. And there's not one program that works for the same child all through the years. So it's really getting to know what's out there. Excellent. And with that, um, any questions that were not responded to throughout the course of today's presentation, we will aspire to get those out to you. A reminder, this will be recorded, available on demand at the Autism Ontario website. They're free for people to join. Please share and share a like. The more people that we get through this program, the more of these webinars we can put on for you. For Tracy, Autism Ontario, and myself, I'd like to thank you for your participation. And we look forward to seeing you at our next Autism Ontario event. Thank you.